I read online, they said in, in Greece, it's mostly the work of frustrated kids whose signatures are all over the city seem like a cry for help to a world that does not see them. Would you say that's a vivid description of every writer? No. no. Yes, yes and no. Everybody does it for their own reason, you know? But let's I'm gonna stick to the topic of Greece. That country has that's the feel. When you get when you get there, you see what you just described. You see the poverty. We go there with the American dollar. Fucking 20 bucks and we're killing it. But these people can't get a job. They can't get paid decent. The police are killing kids. You know, it's like, it is a cry for help, some of them. But I can't say, I can't say that's for everybody because really it's about the culture, graffiti culture. So yeah, they could be crying for help, right? But if you're really doing graffiti for the graffiti culture, that cry for help is fucking, it's neither here nor there. It's like, fuck that cry for help. We doing graffiti now. We were crying for help, but now we're doing graffiti. And in, in Greece, it's really hardcore. Like in Greece, there's no, there's no more walls. You gotta go high because it's grilled. Yet you can't see a fucking wall in Greece. I don't know if they changed it, but when I went, the place was fucking crushed, bro. Like, my boys, we had the jetpacks. My boys were killing it on the jetpack. With the jetpack. Just like, you know, there's no room. And everybody's poor. And it's fucked up. There's trash everywhere. There's shit on the fucking floors. And not to belittle, anybody's country but this is what we seen when we showed to this place and it's it's you know it's pretty sad definitely sad that there's a lot of people crying for help but when it comes to the graffiti the graffiti writers are hardcore graffiti writers you know so you know the cry for help is like a thin line because if you're crying for help once again we're from los angeles so if you're crying for help, you're a bitch. So it, it, that starts to like reflect everywhere. Or it's like, no nah, man, we're doing graffiti. And then we get there and meet with the locals. It's like, nobody mentions a cry for help. We're doing graffiti, it's go time. You get what I'm saying? No, it was written by a critic. You know what I mean? Th these people, it was the writer's observation with their state, how they view it, but. Yeah, because there is a lot of revolutionary graffiti there. Oh, really? Yeah, there's a lot, and uh, they're doing the anarchy sign. So there's a lot of revolutionary graffiti there. There's rollers that say, fuck the police, or the police can't enter. There's a whole, fuck the police area. The police can't even enter. Once the police enters in this area, the whole neighborhood has to throw rocks at the car. So if you see the police, you let them know and people start throwing rocks at the police and the police has to get out of it. So you go into their like, it's kind of not favelas, but it's like their little neighborhood and you'll see like blasting on apartments, fuck the police or no police here. You know, I'm all about fucking police. So when I seen this shit, I was in awe, like damn, there's an area where the police can't come. You know, we hung out there for a few hours just to soak it up, you know, but as far as the critics, I believe they're speaking on that because you know, not to this, the photographers or the critics, but stay in the fucking lane. You're not about this culture. You can, you can try to decipher it, but you can't because you have to earn the experience. All you can do is be a spectator. So don't take those critics too serious when they say shit. Yeah, I always found that interesting how these people that write on subjects that they've never engaged in, you know, like boxing commentators or writers that have never boxed a day in their life, but they're so-called experts and could evaluate every little thing about the sport or subject. It's pretty uh, 
it's almost on the borderline of crazy. You're having someone uh, talk about some a life that they know nothing about. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous, man. It's like, that, that shouldn't even be allowed in the perfect world. But, you know, like, you know, the graffiti writers should, you know, step up and be the critic. So if there's any good critics that are graffiti writers, they should definitely try to take those critics that don't have any experience in the culture's job. <laughs> oh, yeah. there you said it. Yeah. Take the reins back from these yeah, definitely. These fakes. Definitely. So what was the first country you ever traveled to to go do the graffiti? Greece. Oh, it was Greece. It was Greece. Oh, wow. That's funny you mentioned that first. Yeah. Oh, wow. It was definitely Greece. And I went out with a few buddies and, um, Man, I was so excited when we got off the fucking plane. Like the lady who owned the Airbnb, she picked us up. It was five of us, I believe, with a gang of luggage. And she packed us in like a Toyota Corolla fucking wagon or some <laughs> shit. We're all laying on each other and shit. It was the craziest shit ever. And it was funny because as soon as we got off the plane, I don't know how the fuck we already have markers in our pocket. I remember she dropped us off at the Airbnb and fucking as soon as I got off the car, I just started tagging on the fucking window. Like didn't even ask for permission or look around. I just fucking started going and kind of set the vibe. Like it's go time. We're here. You know, so it was pretty fucking cool, man, to experience that. So you guys went out there specifically just to do graffiti. You didn't go out there to see Greece and its and its uh, historical landmarks. You went out there. Well, we're not trying to see no fucking historical landmarks, brother. <laughs> we can see her from afar. That's enough. Let's start the fucking graffiti, man. You know. <laughs> and it's because the people I went with, they're like that. They set the fucking bar times 10. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm, I went to go, like I had talked to my boy A Nice and he told me that he traveled the world doing graffiti. I traveled as a kid with my mom, the world a little bit. So I'm savvy to the traveling, but I'm not savvy to graffiti in different places. And you know, like just to see what these guys brought to the table was amazing. You know, like, they just went there to do graffiti. It was like nine of us at the end. There was the dudes from uh, from San Francisco, from up north, and the dudes from down south, uh, Los Angeles. And it was funny because the dudes I ended up with, which was the LA crowd, they were all about graffiti. Graffiti, graffiti, let's eat the graffiti, let's fucking uh, have a latte and fucking a nice little fucking pastry and graffiti. And then the other boys, they were like, we should go sightseeing and go see the, the Acropolis or whatever the fuck it's called. Um, we should go over here. And then the boy I was with was like, yo, fuck that shit. We ain't trying to see none of that. We're trying to mob. I'm just quiet. Like I said, soaking up game my first time there. But this is the vibe that's being set by the Dons. You know, because I'm learning from kings. So it's like, holy fuck. Like, I can't believe I just heard this man say he's not trying to sightsee. And we're on the other side of the earth. You know, we're far from home. You would think the first thing we're going to do is sightsee. Let's go see something cool. You know, I went behind the ears. And they're like, no, fuck that. We're doing graffiti. So, you know, just to answer your question, you know, that's what the fucking vibe was, man, you know? <laughs> so what, most people just traveling to another country are uncomfortable. They have cold feet. They're in another part of the land. There's a, there's a foreign language being spoken. You didn't have any cold feet by just hopping off and going to do graffiti. No, no, because... Because, excuse me, because we're from Los Angeles, man. So we are prone and conditioned for any situation that might happen. So even though it's a different language, you still 
on a 360 view of your surroundings and we know how to read well, you know? And then in LA, what do we do? You see the fucking police, you fucking run. So we're like, really? Not to toot our horns, but we're everywhere I've been, we're usually a few steps ahead, you know? It's, it's, it's weird, you know? And then we usually meet up with those that are two steps ahead as well. So it's like, we embrace each other, even though we're from different worlds, you know? Cause the last thing we want to do is get caught anywhere. You know, like, even if you can pay your shit off, you don't want to get caught. So did you guys have any contact with other riders there that held you down? Or did you guys just go over there blindly? Blinded. I'm gonna tell you a little story about this shit, right? Please do. Okay, so, you know me, I like to clown around, I fuck around, I don't care who you are, I'm gonna, I wanna say take a jab, I'm just gonna make you laugh, you know, crack a joke. So we get to the graffiti store, you know, I'm fucking pumped up, ready to buy some fucking paint, and we're talking to the dude at the graffiti store, and the dude shows no emotion whatsoever. We're cracking jokes, we're buying paint. And he was so hardcore that he was like, oh, another guy from LA came and spent way more than you guys. And we're <laughs> like, what the fuck, bro? We just spent fucking $800 in paint. What the fuck you talking about, bro? You know, cracking jokes and he's just not having it, bro. This guy's heavy set motherfucker. Fucking, you know, I didn't know who the fuck he was. I'm like, who the fuck is this guy, you know? Who the fuck, why does this guy think he's hot shit? Won't even laugh at my joke. Whatever. So, we run out of paint, which is the best thing on planet Earth. So we go back to this fucking art store, and we're like, um, you know, like, follow us on Instagram. You know, now we're, now we're like, um, we have dialogue now because it's our second time back. You know, he owns the store, so he definitely has to be cool with us. We're going to spend money. I mean, at least have that decency, which he did. So then we give him the Instagrams. And then I would say if not a few, if not a few hours later, but the next day, he hits us on the fucking Instagram. is like, you guys are fucking killing shit. And then that's when we earned our keep with the fucking God of graffiti because we did not know who he was, you know? We found out who he was, he opened up to us. And then that's how we got some local love because of we had to earn our shit. But at first it was all cold shoulder. We're fucking Americans, get the fuck away from us, you know? It's just how they feel about Americans a little bit. Is there any difference between painting in these other countries as opposed to the U.S.? Or is it just the same? No, it's completely different, man. It's like, for Greece, it's completely different. And, and it's always a vibe. It's like every place is different. I can't say any place is the same. Greece, it was like, um, uh, just poor, but... Everything is marble. So the texture is beautiful. So it like creates this whole vibe where you see some buildings and like the gold statues on like the Caesar looking fools butt naked. It's fucking weird, but the statues are gold. Outside's all marble. And it's like, oh shit, we're fucking tagging on marble. You know, where it's like it's just a completely different vibe. You know, you're, you're on your toes looking for their cop cars now. You know, you're, you're looking for an evacuation route. And you don't know what the fuck the next street is. You don't know where, no, where nothing's at. So it's completely different, dude. I mean, it, we, I have the same vibe for my instinct purpose that I will never lose. But it's like unmatched. By far, it's like, where do I go? What do I do? Like, I don't know anybody. What happens if I get lost? 
You get what I'm saying? Or what the fuck you gonna do? So how strategic were you guys in have? Did you guys have a rendezvous spot in, that you would meet just in case if something happened? Usually what we tend to do is don't forget the fucking address of the Airbnb that you came at. <laughs> <laughs> because we, we've gotten lost, bro. You know what I'm saying? We've gotten lost with no more fucking... You know, one story, we almost we went to hit some trains and we got into this wild police chase in Greece. And then we got away. Some of us got away. And then my phone was dead. I had no more fucking money. I see like a, uh, a little truck with some like Indian Taliban looking motherfuckers. I gave them my watch and they took me to the bus station. I thought they were going to rob me, but they took me to the bus station Dropped me off. The fucking bus was taking off. I ran to the bus, jumped on the bus. And I ended up at the train slash location through this bus. Mind you, I have no phone. We got lost. No minutes, no service on the phone. So I get to the last train station where the bus dropped me off. And I have Wi-Fi. So now I'm able to contact. I'm at rendezvous point, which is where we got dropped off by the train. So that would be rendezvous, just common sense and instinct. So I get there, use the Wi-Fi, and my boy said, two of my boys, they're on their way. They have Wi-Fi too, they were at a place where they have Wi-Fi. So we met up there, and you know, that was like a rendezvous we made up just on natural instinct, bro. It's like, it's a beautiful thing, you know? The other homies got caught, you know, they went on a wild police chase, they got, Fucking caught at the end, you know, slammed down. But we were grateful to get away, you know. And then we we're celebrating back home on the train. And then we got to rendezvous, the Airbnb. We had Wi-Fi there. Now we start communicating to see what's going on with the boys. Did the two that got caught, did they lock it up after that and say, I'm done with this trip? Or did they? Nah, did they... nah, fuck no. <laughs> 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 no nah, man, the dudes I went with are fucking hardcore, bro. And they're savages. This wasn't their first rodeo. This was my first rodeo, you know. So are the penalties more lenient over there? Uh, yeah, usually the case, man. You know, usually the case because you're American. So they're not really gonna like process you in unless you're hitting like a fucking some kind of crazy landmark or monument. You know, if the whole place is filled with graffiti, you you know, you kind of feel the vibe, like, you, they might not take you to jail. They might just take your shit, you know? But remember, like, what I want to keep clear is even if you could pay or it's the, you know, the penalty is not that harsh, we still don't want to get caught. And what's the, the second country you travel to to do graffiti? Oh, man. You know, don't quote me on the fucking, the order, because I'm like that, bro. I, I have it up here, and that's all that matters. Is <laughs> <laughs> so, you don't, yeah. so you don't remember the second. I, I feel it's, it was Guatemala. So Guatemala um, trip out like my boy Poole and uh, the other homie from PPLA. Um, they asked my homeboy A nice to go, right? And I was just like, I want to say FOMO, fear of missing out. I would say more of like, I want to go. I'm the type to speak up. I'm not going to be like, oh man, they didn't take me. Or oh man, like all that victim shit's out. So I'm like, I'm going to open my mouth. Can I go with y'all to go them all? And they're like, oh shit, you would like to go? I'm like, yeah, I want to go. Like... You know, this, this fucking half of this shit. And it's funny, we had a meeting on the trip with BPLA. And BPLA was like, you know, my boy A-Nice couldn't make it. And BPLA was like, A-Nice is not going, so that's the nigga. That's the man. If he's not going, we're not going to pay you to go. You know, I took it as disrespect. I was like, bro, I'm not asking you to pay anything for me. I pay for my own shit. I just want to go. And then they seen that and that builds character because you're not looking for a handout. And then 
that's how that trip took place. So I came out of pocket and went with my homeboy pool. We went together. We, we didn't even know each other that much. We went and sure enough, like they were like, do something for BPLA. I'm not sure. And I'll never forget, bro. Fucking, we went to the paint store. I got like fucking 12 fucking silvers and like 12 blues. And I fucking banged out a corrugated gate. A big ass below poverty level. I'm talking about stretched it out. You know, they helped me fill in, but I ran everything, you know, like, and they, they were proud. I put on for them. That was the first time where I, got, I had to prove myself to a company, you know, to a person of business. It's like, oh shit, buy that dude some dinner. And that's when the trip started getting good, you know, it's like, it, that's how that came about. Yeah, going back to how you said you didn't know this cat, it's so crazy how that camaraderie can align so quick. It's almost like uh, you hit maybe the county or something and you two dudes are the only West Siders in there, but you might be from two different areas that kind of have some friction, but that ability of you being two West Siders just aligns that camaraderie real quick. Definitely. And you know what? I would have to say because I'm such a great person. Like I can't, I can't, and you know, like I attract good people and like I'm such a great person that I'm, I'm not, you can count on me, you can trust me. I'm not gonna do you scandalous. I'm not gonna steal from you. You could leave money on the table. I'm not gonna take that shit. And then people gravitate to me. You know, I'm cool as fuck, bro. You know what I'm saying? I'm a little hardcore, a little loose, you know, screws ain't there sometimes, but as far as the vibe, I always try to give my best so I can reciprocate their best. And once you give somebody your best, nine times out of ten, they're going to give you their best. And then the camaraderie fucking starts immediately, like, you know? Like when I met you. So what was your what was your fondest experience when you were out there in Guatemala? Ah <laughs> uh, man, riding dirt bikes on the fucking black sand, bro. <laughs> really? I mean somewhat. That was like the sightseeing shit that we're not into. But um I would say No, if that's your fondest memory, that's your I mean, fondest yeah, memory. Yeah, because we went we went out there, we went out there and there was like a, a narco boat, an abandoned boat. And I painted on that boat. So that was like a big thing. Like, oh shit. Like the locals are like, that's a narco boat. And I was like, for real? It's gonna be painting? And they're like, yeah, it's a bad man. They bring the drugs in and leave the fucking boat and take off. So, oh, I gotta take this <laughs> fucking boat. It's like a canoe and shit, bro. <laughs> but I would say that was probably like the most memorable. But the fondest part, the fondest part would definitely be being solo. I was solo most of the time. I was with a local, but running my own program. The local was there really to have my back. But I was just running my fucking own program. You know, we had the jetpack. Everybody knows what the jetpack is now. If you're not familiar with it, it's the fucking, the ladder we use. So I took the ladder with me. So I'm walking Guatemala with a backpack full of paint. Mind you, I'm dressed in slacks, uh, Jordan 1s, button up, and a dad hat because of the gangs. So I'm low key. Like you have to look through my disguise to see that I'm up to something, but I have a backpack. So right off the bat, I'm catching fat cat tags on the street, broad daylight, just fucking shit up, bro. Like. You know, like doing shit that I don't usually do extra with it. So, my boy from BPLA had a driver for him. He's a buck. He's a fucking boss, homie. This big dog boss. Fucking drill down. Fucking big dinners. He's a fucking boss, dog. So, my boy has a driver. And he's... My boy likes to... He likes to sightsee. <laughs> he stay at the room sightseeing. <laughs> if you get what I'm saying. <laughs> Anyhow, the driver would pick me up at night. And I'm like, fuck you. I'm going to tell this motherfucker what to do. So, dude, we're at the red light. I'm jumping out the back of the car doing tags, jumping back in. 
He's making a right. I'm telling him to stop. I'm jumping out the car, attach a tag. This is like 1990 fucking six shit. You know, this is 1999 shit in Guatemala, bro. The local I'm with, I'm walking with him. He's like, yeah, dude, I got shot at right here last week by the gang makers, gang members that live across the street. And my heart just dropped, bro. I'm like, are you fucking serious? He's like, yeah. So I'm walking now and I don't even know what the fuck is going on. But the energy that I keep protects me. But that's the fondest memory, bro, of that hardcore shit. Jumping out the taxi, catch his spots. Dude, I had the taxi pull over on the highway. Uh, you know the overpasses? You, you, you pass the overpass and it's a bridge. So what holds the bridge and the overpass is a big, long wall. So on the big, long wall, I have the fucking driver waiting and I did fucking like four throws along the fucking wall, just going back to back, just fucking spraying, outlining, throwing cans, running out, getting more pink, just wilding the fuck out, bro. You know, and then some locals, I told some locals, some females, I'm like, yo, they're like, where you come from? And I told them the area. I told the driver, I was like, tell them the area. I don't know. And they're like, nah, you shouldn't be over there. That's where all the killings take place. Like, what are you doing right there? And it was the most airy place I've ever mobbed. Like, it was fucking, it felt crazy, bro. But like we said from the beginning, you know, that rush, that energy, you know, go time, go time, you know? So that's the fondest memories of Guatemala is like that type of vibe. So in Guatemala, they have street gangs that are, are not fond of that too. Then oh, definitely, it. definitely. I was doing a legal walk, I asked permission, and I, was, I started with the M, right? And then, so the bus pulls up, and the bus driver jumps out, and the dude that's like, you know, for the buses, they whistle. And they call out, oh, the bus is here in Spanish, you know. Oh, everybody, let's go. The bus is here. Everybody lines up, jumps on the bus. So that dude came up to me. He was like, yo, bro, that's MS you're writing? And I was like, what the fuck? I was like, hey, bro, absolutely not, bro. This is some graffiti shit. I come from the States. There, no gangbang, bro. Yeah, <laughs> please, please don't even think that. <laughs> And these dudes were wearing like my dad's old clothes from the 90s and shit, bro. It was so funny. He looked like my fucking dad, bro, you know? <laughs> I was like, what the fuck, bro? And, and some dude's house was grilled, bro. I'm walking. I kind of tag. And of course, I hit my boy up. And this motherfucker comes down his house with a fucking bat. Trying to chase me down and hit me with a bat. So that's how crazy this place is, you know? It's like... It's frowned upon still, big time. What was the third country you hit? Man, they bringing up all these good memories, man. Taiwan. And what was that like? Oh man, beautiful, bro. You know, I, I went to another place and they called Taiwan the hipster, uh, the hipster country of China. And you know, I tripped out. I got there and I was so entitled to our American way. Like I was, like the first day and a half, I was upset that there was a language barrier. Like a fucking entitled American fuck. You know, I'm like I'm going to somebody else's country and I'm entitled because I don't understand their language. So that was, you know, I was just a culture shock. But as the days went by, like, you know, we were traveling through train, you know, and then the culture really embraced us. And you know, it's a be it's beautiful, bro. Like everybody is dressed nice. Everybody has Supreme on, everybody has vape on. Everybody has all these things. Like, you know, we're, we're hype beasts out here in uh, West LA, bunch of hype beasts. I go over there and it's like hype beast times a million. Like everybody's swagged the fuck out. Everybody's cool. And it was amazing to see like, oh shit, like, these motherfuckers are cool, you know? And it was a culture shop. Everybody's on their mopeds. There's like 50 mopeds in one lane and they're all smashing. And then it just opened my eyes to like, wow, 
these people don't have much either, but they're so clean. They're so well-dressed. They're so nice. Like, I try to tip people, and they're like, nah, we don't do that here. And I'm like, nah, fuck that. I got American money. Here's a fucking extra 40 bucks. They're like, hell no. Nah. We don't do that. So that was a culture shock, you know, where it's like, damn, these people are so nice, you know? Why do you think that is, that these other countries, they, they roll out the red carpet, and they have so much respect for you, and then in America, it's... uh. There ain't no love in the big city, you know what I mean? Well, that's the thing, you know, we were uh, touching base on Los Angeles. That's how Los Angeles is, man. And, you know, I kind of, I, I, I just noticed that. And that's why I, I preach travel, because it opens up your mind, your her expands your horizons to a point where it's like, damn, it's different. These people are showing love. These people are cooking with their hearts. These people are just embody love. You know, and it's hard to find, you know, like in in the big cities, you know, because we're all corrupted from what the propaganda is putting to us. And then you get to Taiwan and everybody's so nice, you know? Even like, let's say for instance, you ever gone to massage your feet in LA? Like they'll be talking shit about you and the lady will be mad at her job. You get a massage on your feet, because we had that at the bottom of our Airbnb. Like after my missions, I would go get my my feet massage. <laughs> it was like the craziest thing in the world. My life couldn't get better, bro. <laughs> and it's like, they're doing it with love. And not no kinky fucking, you know, fucking, what is it? Happy ending shit. No, no, we're not talking that shit. We're talking about just the best fucking massage treat you like a king, you know, sensual, just everything out of a beautiful, from a beautiful place. So what was your fondest memory in Taiwan that you experienced? <laughs> Whether it be graph or the people? Well, the first thing I told you was the people. So that, that had to be number one, and just seeing them swagged out like with all that gear. The second thing is like, we go to do graffiti. So like I told you, it's different everywhere. So, we wake up early. I wake up early everywhere I go. It's just a thing. Three hours of sleep, four hours of sleep, fuck it. I want to wake up early and take advantage of our time. So we notice we get up early and nothing's fucking open, bro. Like, there's like one breakfast spot. Like, we're like, what the fuck is going on, bro? Like, there's stores open, but like, where can we get a bite to eat? You know, we're spoiled. We want to eat good. We're on vacation. We can't find shit, bro. And it's like, what the fuck? And I was like, man, I got a great idea. Everything's closed. We can't find a bite to eat. Let's just fucking do graffiti from 9 o'clock to fucking 1 p.m. in the morning. So sure enough, we fucking get suited and booted. We're fucking doing throw-ups, broad fucking daylight of businesses that are fucking closed. Like, the business is closed on the left and it's open down on the right because it's shutters. So they're meal prepping for the night and we're hitting the shutters over here where they have no fucking clue. But everything's closed so we're just fucking smacking shit, bro. You know, like we figured it out, you know? We're like, fuck it, bro. By two o'clock, we got like five fucking fillings. We're just fucking coasting, waiting till it turns night. You know what I'm saying? Like. That was had had to be the fondest part of this fucking of the Taiwan shit. I went with Mukes. He was younger at the time, but that fool was a fucking killer. And another thing, he caught a tower. He went up there and caught a tower, climbed the ladder, and did a Mukes fleet. He did both names, did the fill in. I watched his back. I, I was the cameraman, and it's still there till today. And that has to be like I never left. A fucking spot so monumental anywhere. I would like to thank Mukes for that, and it, it was pretty cool. And on that trip, you also had no uh, contact with riders in the country. That trip, bro? Fuck no. Wow. No local, no no locals. In a uh, language barrier, we didn't even want to touch. No disrespect to anybody ever. I just speak sometimes passive aggressive. Don't take this disrespect, but we didn't even want the fucking locals. We wanted to fucking 
earn our shit. And then it's funny because uh, I have a boy who goes to Taiwan and he was like, yo, I seen y'all up. And I'm like, for real? He goes, yo, did you, did you guys have a, a, a tour guide? Y'all were, y'all were with some locals? And I was like, nah. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's what we wanted, you know, for them to think we were with locals, but we, we weren't. So we did, we did a good job, you know, as far as like getting out there and after it in Taiwan. I was walking at fucking four in the morning. I could see my fucking building and I'm walking in circles. I can't fucking find the way out through this fucking neighborhoods. But I could see my building from far away. I probably didn't get home till 9.30 that morning. And it was like five in the morning, bro. I was lost. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was beautiful, bro. You know, it's like I'm lost in Taiwan walking solo. You know, it's not dangerous over there. So, you know, and they don't steal. You know, so I leave my phone, record myself. You know, it, it was pretty cool. I, I have some footage for that, and I have some like um, really good pictures from out of Taiwan, like some dope shit, man. So, what was the next uh, country? Oh man, the next one was uh, Barcelona. Shout out to Nemec. From Barcelona, Boris, and I'm sorry, I forget the dudes we did the clean trains with, but nothing but respect for these gods, the gods of Barcelona. Those are the gods out there. Yeah, for sure, dog. For fucking sure. They held you down out there? They did. They did. That's beautiful. Yeah. Through two other colleagues of mine, they went there first, and then when we went, when we went to Barcelona, uh, we linked up with them, and they showed us around it. We had a great time. Barcelona's the only place I would move to that I've been to so far. Wow. I mean, that, that I would consider... That's a bold statement. Yeah, that I would consider serious. You know, like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll go, you know, I'll say I'll go back to these places, but like, Barcelona, if I could retire to Barcelona and have a house there, I'll, I'll definitely do it. Unless I find somewhere new. So but, the country was that beautiful, or you love the people, the, the food, what the, was it? Um, the country was that beautiful. They have a beach, and for all you fucking freaky motherfuckers, it's a nude beach. So hurry <laughs> up and get your ass over there. <laughs> yeah, but tell them old, old ass motherfuckers to put their dicks away, nobody try to see that shit, dog. <laughs> no, but you know, they have a beach. A lot of the places I go to, the beaches are far. It's like, what the fuck? You know, we're, I'm spoiled. I'm from the West, bro. The beach is right here. And I'm like, what the fuck? How is your beach two hours away? I would have never fucking came here, you know? But it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful place, man. It's, it's really nice. The culture's cool. Everybody walks, so they're in shape. You don't really see overweight people or obese people. So it's like... Interesting. Yeah, they say everything in Europe is organic, supposedly. What's the craziest incident that happened in Barcelona? I would say a funny incident. Um, where the locals have us in like a, what is it? An industrial area. So we're going wild in the industrial area, right? We're, we're, and remember, we're on scooters. Vespas. We all have our Vespas. We're all on scooters. We have, I'm on a scooter with like 10 cans, spray cans under the seat. And uh, I have probably another 14 to 15 spray cans where the helmet goes. And I have a dude behind me on the Vespa with a backpack full of paint. So we're armed to the fucking T, right? So my buddy that I'm carrying jumps in the car with the other homie. And we're fucking killing shit in the industrial area. We get really comfortable. And boom, we get fucking pulled over. And my boy has these fucking, um, what is it called, bro? The vapes to smoke marijuana. But he got like 20 of them in like a saran wrap vacuum seal. Like, it looks all bad if he gets caught with this shit. So right there was the craziest part. One of the craziest parts for me. I was like, damn, my boy. We got caught up by the police. If my boy gets caught for this shit, he could, he could be facing some fucking shit. You know, I don't know. But it was crazy to be in that situation where we had to talk our way out of it before the police gets too into our personal belongings. You know, so it was all a fucking, really just a manipulated situation 
that we had to get out of. So that was kind of crazy. That was one. But the craziest part was when we caught the clean trains in Barcelona. We caught the clean trains. We got chased. I got caught. I ended up in jail for... This was the second time we went. So we went to Barcelona twice. This is the second time. I, we got there Monday. And I told the homie, I was like, yo, I want to hit clean trains. So we got there like at 10 at night. We had fucking dinner. We got, we got paint. By fucking 2 o'clock in the morning, we're fucking camping out waiting to hit a clean train and shit. The same fucking night. 4 o'clock in the morning comes, I'm fucking Barcelona jail and shit. Fighting a case on the fucking metro system. Fucking had me in a fucking shit jail. Um, for two days, I had a public defender. So I'm, I'm fighting the actual case. Like a public defender is coming to my cell. And I'm like, damn. I, I, I'm going to the big house. You know, and I'm stabbing to jail life, unfortunately. So, and the locals were like, if you go to jail. I was like, what's the protocol? They're like, fight. Like, oh my fucking god! I was like, here we go. So I, I, mentally, I'm already prepared for this shit, you know. But the pandemic had just hit, so I got busted that Monday, and I got released. Um, fucking, I believe Thursday. We got there Monday, so Tuesday. We went to Tuesday. I got released Thursday because not enough evidence. I, I we didn't fess up. Me and the homie, we didn't fess up. They asked us what the pain was for. We said it wasn't ours. So we just denied, denied, denied. They let us go. And then they were like, oh, we're going to let you go. But you, I don't know if you're aware. The borders are closing. So you better get your ass home because of the pandemic. So we got out Thursday of the day. And we had to leave Friday. So I basically went to Barcelona. They hit a clean train, go to jail. And then fucking fly back home and shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I was in debt to get back home because I think the flight was like $1,600 or some shit. I was like, oh my God. I paid that off though. You know, whatever. Is there any difference between the jail in Barcelona and LA County? Fuck yeah, bro. And the jail in Barcelona is about the dirtiest shit you're ever going to see in your life, bro. Mosquitoes, fucking... There's a fucking hole you're pissing shit in. Wow. They, they're giving, it's dirty, bro. They're just throwing sick motherfuckers right there. And this is pandemic time, so you, like any sick motherfucker that comes in, it was the scariest shit, dude. They brought this dude just fucking coughing a fucking storm and shit. I'm like, yo, get this motherfucker out of here. I was on some LA shit. Get him out of here before I fuck him up. They're like, all right. <laughs> I'll be honest, you know. I ain't the toughest man in the world. I'm not trying to, you know. Uh, put that on me. I'm just saying I was like that. I was like, get this sick motherfucker out of here. And then we had to come back, bro. You know, so it was unfortunate for that trip. But that was the second time in Barcelona. The first time it was fun. We did graffiti. We're on the Vespas. So we're, we're pulling up in the Vespas. Uh, my homie's doing the outline. My other, I'm filling in. Then my homie's doing the background. And when I'm done filling in, I back up and I'm the cameraman. So we were in sync with my boys without even speaking on it. We just knew our fucking program. We knew our role. We did like maybe I think 13 to 15 crew bombs in one night just to prove a point. Spot after spot after spot after spot after spot. After spot. Just crew shit. Just to shit on motherfuckers. You know? Like hardcore shit, bro. Like, you know, hats off to the dudes I was with. They're just hardcore motherfuckers, dog. Did you guys have people holding you down Barcelona, or was it just balls out? No, no, no. We, we, we can go balls out anywhere, but we did have the locals. You know, they took us to paint, you know, like a different city. So you had contact with writers. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And shout, shout out to the Montana store. They held us down, and the people there were really nice, and the paints were super cheap. Shout out to Montana, Barcelona.